You're listening to Widowed AF with Rosie Gilmoss and Lucinda Boast. We've invited some members of the world's most exclusive club to bravely share their stories. Join us for some honest conversations about living a different life, the crushing lows, the surprising highs and everything in between. Please note this is a podcast about death. Carefully read the episode descriptions and be kind to yourself. But for now, welcome to our podcast. Let us begin. Hello and welcome back to the Widowed AF podcast with myself, Lucinda Boast, and the lovely Rosie Gilmoss. Hello. Now, here at Widowed AF, we often refer to widowhood as the world's most exclusive club, the one that nobody wants to join. Our next guest, Jess, was a member of that club twice over before she even turned 30. And today she's going to share with us what that was really like and how on earth she made it through. Welcome, Jess. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you for coming on, Jess. We're very grateful. Um, and it's nice to be able to, to see you, actually. We've known each other for quite a long time, haven't we, through the wonders of the, the interweb. Um, but uh, it, this is probably as close as we've got to face-to-face, which is, is lovely. Um, <laughs> Jess, you were, you know, your story is is pretty unique. Um, and it's it's really, really sad, actually. I, I just speaking to you in, in sort of pre-production meeting. So... I'd like if you if you were able just to give us a, a sort of a, a rundown, if that's the right word, of, of your story in your own words. Yeah, so briefly, um, I met Jason when I was a teenager. Um, we had two boys, uh, got married in 2013, um, and then shortly after that we found out we had a third baby on the way. Uh, when I was um, pregnant um, with our third um, Jason um, was involved in an accident at work um, and he never came home. So he was electrocuted whilst at work. Um, oh, goodness. Following that, I had our little boy. Um, two years later, I met someone new. Um, and then six months after that, he was diagnosed with cancer. Um, fast forward <laughs> another year and he actually died. We got married 36 hours before he died. And that is how I was widowed twice before I was 13. That is oh. a real whistle stop tour, Jess. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> there you go, done. We're finished. <laughs> it's that way. No, yeah, that's the that, that, one. There you go, um, there's the summary. Goodness me, goodness me what, what a what horrific, horrifically tragic thing to happen. So you were pregnant with your third baby when you were told that the father of your children had died. So... Yeah. I can, you know, obviously feel some empathy here because I, my daughter was six months when um, I found out that the Ben had died, and we both found out. Well, all three of us actually found out with a knock at the door, didn't we? Yeah. Can you? Would you mind going back to that night? I know it's difficult, but we are asking our guests to do some quite difficult digging here, and just, you know, just take us back to that night, please. Yeah. So um, it wasn't abnormal for Jason to be working late, especially at that time of year. There was a big push at the time to get all um, school kitchens ready for the free school meals that were being brought out. Um, so he was working late nights quite often. So we spoke at around 3 p.m. So I was at home with Toby, who was four, and George, who was 21 months. Um, and we just had our scan two days prior for the third baby. And all was looking fine. We we're both super excited. Um and we spoke around 3 p.m. He asked how I was feeling because I've been suffering from a little bit of um, morning sickness. Um, and he said he'd be working late. He wasn't sure how late, but he'd let me know. So that's fine. I'll talk to you later. I'll let you know what we're having for tea. And you can tell me if you want anything saving. Um, just the usual chat. There was nothing abnormal about the conversation. Uh, we ended it with saying that we loved each other. Um, and we hung up. So around 5 o'clock. I rang him again, so we'd keep in touch throughout the day. That was normal. Like every few hours, he'd touch base and get a good idea as to when he'd be back. Um, and there was no answer, which again, not abnormal. He was working um, as a catering engineer, and at the time, he was installing new kitchens into um, a primary school in uh, the next county along. Um, there was no answer, so I tried on his work phone, and again, no answer. Not too concerned. I made tea for the boys, and my dad was also um, at the house at the time, made us all tea. Tried again about six-ish before bath time. Again, nothing. And by that point, he'd usually have got back in contact. 
to a phone. Maybe he's driving home and he's not connected to the Bluetooth or similar. Just kept waiting and waiting. Um, and then it got to bedtime um, for Toby, so 7.30. And he never, ever missed a bedtime call, even when he was working late. Never. Um, so I was ringing to let him know Toby was going to bed and asked him if he'd like to say goodnight and there was nothing. And that, it was at that point that I thought something's actually wrong. In my mind, mm. I was trying to think maybe maybe he's got a new woman that he hadn't told me about and he's run off with her. Maybe he's had an accident and lost the use of his arms and legs. As awful as these scenarios <laughs> were, they were better than the alternative. Yeah. So, Bargaining, yeah, far than that yeah. well. Yeah, so my uh, so I put Toby to bed myself. Um, my dad stayed for a little while till about 8.30. Um, and I said, it's all right, just go. He'll be back at some point. You know, mistakes get made. You leave your phone somewhere. It could have been anything. So I was breastfeeding George on the sofa um, about 9 p.m. And then there was a knock at the door. And you you just know, my heart absolutely sank. So I was sitting there with George. I was pregnant. I was holding my little toddler. Walked to the door and opened it. And there was two um, police officers there. And they said, well, I was Haslam at the time. So Mrs. Haslam said, yeah, can I put my baby to bed? Because I knew it was going to be bad news. Because you don't get a knock at the door from a police officer unless it's bad news. So can I put my no. baby to bed? He said, yeah. So I shut the door and I locked it just in case it was... In my head, I was thinking, maybe it's a scammer that's going to try and rob me. Like, because I was just grasping at straws to try and find any, um, um, anything that would mean he wasn't dead. But anyway, it's took, incredible, but, isn't it? The thing, the, the scenarios your brain will create okay. to protect you from the truth at that point. It, we both, we both had that experience. And so yeah. much of what you say resonates. Mm -hmm. So I locked the door, took George upstairs, practically dropped him in his cot because. I just had to get back, back downstairs. They opened the door and I said, come in. And then they started walking and I turned around and I said, is he dead? And they just said, yeah, I'm afraid he is. And I was like, oh, come in. Sorry about mm. the mess. Straight away, as soon as I had that yeah. confirmation, <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm really sorry about the mess. And they came in and one of them perched herself on the corner of a sofa, which was covered in this mountain of washing that I hadn't folded yet. Um, and they explained to me what had happened. It was at um, 4.30 p.m. So obviously only 30 minutes before I'd started ringing him. The paramedics were still working on him whilst I started calling at first. Um, I said to him, I said, I'm, I'm pregnant. And the female police officer said, yeah, I know. How are you feeling? And I couldn't get my head around the fact that they were more concerned about me than the situation. Mm -hmm. I was asking about Jason, but they were more conscious about making sure I had someone with me. So I rang my dad. Or did they ring my dad for me? That's a, I can't actually remember. Someone rang my dad, uh, wow. and, he came back and a, one of my sisters came, and I offered to make everyone a cup of tea, um, because it was like, right, we've got this information. What the heck do we do now? What do we do? We make a cup of tea. Yeah, so British, aren't we? And then you yeah. and you go into almost host mode, don't you? I can remember yeah. offering me the, the police officer's tea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was fluffing cushions. Yeah. <laughs> Why? I was worried because I didn't have a bra on, you know, I mean, <laughs> the, the weird things that you the, that you focus on. Yeah. I had oh, a basket okay. of the washing as well. That was really familiar. Mm -hmm. I just I stared at this basket of washing. I think you focus on the things you can control, don't you? And you can control making sure everyone has a drink. You can control making sure your boobs are supported. You can't control anything else. <laughs> but you well, can control those little These days I'm not sure, Death. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, oh, we, we digressed then, didn't we? Um, um, please do carry on and tell us, because obviously you then got to tell your children and, um, you know, George presumably was too young to comprehend, but uh, Toby was of an age where he would understand. So how on earth do you, how on earth do you tell your children this? So my dad stayed over that night. He sat downstairs. I remember during the night, quite a few times getting up and going standing outside on the driveway because I didn't sleep that night and just looking up at the sky <laughs> and that being interspersed with crying and throwing up and it was all very dramatic um but then the next morning when Toby woke up and he said where's daddy has he gone to work because obviously he thought he'd gone to bed daddy'd come in slept the night and then gone out early which wasn't abnormal but I had to sit him down and say daddy died there was an accident and he won't be coming back 
Um, and it, he had to ask quite a few times what it meant because we've not dealt with death of a person no. in his life. No. We dealt with the death of a rabbit a few weeks prior. So I had to say, yeah, he's gone to be in the stars with your rabbit, which... Now, Jess, we tell people not to compare the death of a spouse to the death of an animal, so be careful, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think um, as adults, definitely do not tell me that your dog died and you feel the same as when my husband died. Um, but for Toby, his yes, comprehension of, of him being gone completely was the only thing he knew was his rabbit. And I was like... And but his rabbit got taken by a fox, so slightly different scenario. Um, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I had to explain that to him. But with George, like you said, he was much too young to comprehend it. For weeks and weeks, he would look out the window and say, where's daddy's van? Where's daddy's van? Um, and on the one occasion it got brought back so we could take things out of it that were Jason's, he thought daddy was home, which was oh, absolutely heartbreaking. Um, ben drove a white transit van and for a long <laughs> time, I mean, Hector was five, but he has autism, so <laughs> it's sort of a little bit late. And he, um, for a long time, he, every time we saw a white transit van, it would bring, you know, is that dad? Is that dad? Yeah. Yeah. It's their little hearts. And it's, it's just a horrible thing to have to do, isn't it? <laughs> it just feels like you're breaking the heart all over again every time you have to say it, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It does. And they do ask you repeatedly, don't they? And yeah. it's almost like they're hoping your answer will change. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's like when they ask you for a snack 70 million times because eventually you'll say yes and perhaps they're yes. hoping that yes. the same sort of... Yeah. Well, yeah. so Jess, you, you gave birth to your baby without without your husband, without their dad. And who, who was with you at the birth, Jess? So one of my sisters was there. Um, it was all... You know what? As far as births go, it was absolutely perfect. It was quick. It was, um, I didn't have any pain relief because there was no time for it. It was, it was a perfect birth. Um, he was a whopping £10.4. So he just um, practically walked out. Um, you know what? I think because I was so focused on this baby and making sure I kept him healthy and happy, I just think I couldn't think about any of the sadness that surrounded it at the time. But um throughout the pregnancy was all about staying as calm as possible it was all about getting things prepared um and as far as raising a baby on your own goes i think it went pretty darn well my older two were as helpful as they could be um especially my oldest he would sit and hold baby barnaby whilst i grabbed a shower or went to the loo and it just worked i think with third babies they do just slot in anyway but Barnaby had extra no choice but to do so but Jeff I realize I'm sort of harking back to my own experience quite a lot in this conversation but I feel that particularly at this point in, in our lives there was a lot of similarities you know I, I given birth my daughter was six months when the police knocked now I often say that I felt like this baby kind of kept me going because with the older two, I was having to manage their trauma and their, their sadness as well as my own, but this baby had absolutely no clue. So mm -hmm. all she needed from me was the necessities of, you know, being a mother. So the feeding, the changing, the cuddles, that sort of, you know, and I went back to did things like yoga because I didn't want her life to be tainted. And what I'm hearing from you is that the pregnancy with Barnaby kind of gave you this, you, you had to eat, you had to sleep, you had to try and keep yourself well for your baby. Um, and so when he, when, when he was born, um, were you able to sort of lose yourself in that lovely new mother bubble or at this point did the trauma kind of land? And I'm, I did really enjoy him being a newborn. I think this um, it brought a new hope and a new life and a new future because when your entire future gets taken away from you, to then have this gift, if you will, which yeah. is part of that person being brought back into your life, it does give you a new hope. And even now, he has so many similarities to Jason, even though he never, ever met him. He's going through a pretty complicated time with his grief at the moment. He feels sort of lost, a bit like he doesn't belong, like he's the odd one out with his brothers because he never met Jason. So it's complicated yeah. in that sense, but he feels really close to him in the fact that he is very similar to him. So obviously there is a lot of Jason's genes they're very strong in Barnaby. So I think that gives him some comfort. And it gives me a lot of comfort as well. 
to see the goofy dances he does, which were exactly the same as what Jason used to do. And it is kind of like a new hope just brought with Barnaby. These little miracles. I I, I, I feel similar with Tabs, actually, because I often I'll glance at her and she's got very much his eyes and like it's like they kind of left you a little a part of them, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It's they it's special. So Jess, um, in the early days of uh, having Barnaby, you struggled to maintain your garden, didn't you? And this is how you came to meet husband number two, uh, Tom. Talk, talk us through how that happened. So Barnaby was, I think he must have been around 18 months. And as you said, it was tricky to keep on top of everything. Um, the outside spaces sort of got left to go a bit wild in all honesty. So I wasn't I can actively, relate. <laughs> I wasn't actively looking to date someone. Um I was actively looking for a gardener though. Um so I put it out to some of my friends, can anyone recommend someone? Got a couple of numbers and Tom's was just the first one that I came to. Sent him a message. Uh, he came around to give me a quote and I had two friends there at the time. And as soon as he left they were both like, he was well fit. I'm like, I know. <laughs> So at that time, it was just a case of, I've got a gardener, it's a bit dishy. That was it. So we came to do wow. the garden uh, a week or two later. Did a great job. He was glistening in the sun outside. He had a wonderful tan on his bald head. <laughs> um, and it was really funny. And it said that he said he didn't have any kids, but he was interacting with Barnaby. And he was just really entertaining and friendly. And he was really funny. Um, so he finished the work that day, um, and I paid him and after I paid him, he was like, so would you like to go on a date sometime? So I think great business skills, making sure he got paid. Cause if I said no, <laughs> yeah, but if, it would be really awkward <laughs> to say, well, can you, can you pay me? So, uh, I was quite taken aback. This must have been amazing just to just be able and also like, sorry, I've, I've interrupted you cause I just want to pick up on this because when you are widowed, you sort of feel a bit, um. We start to be almost dehumanised. You don't feel like a, you know, like a desirable mm-hmm. woman that you. And then, for somebody that you, you've obviously found quite attractive to, then ask you out, like, you know, you must have felt like, yeah, I'm back in the world. I'm back in the game. I got three kids, but I'm still sexy, you know. And and then, you know, to tell what happened next. I want to know yeah. what happened. Yeah, no, I, I did. I did feel that way. I did make sure he knew that I was single. So, uh, like, when he came to do the quote, I was like, oh yeah, it's got this way because my. Uh, this sounds awful. I was like, oh, yeah, my husband died, so there's no one to do the garden. So I made sure he knew I was single. Yeah. Maybe if I hadn't have mentioned that, then he might not have approached me. But, you know, I thought the connection was there. I thought I'd drop it in. I was uh, I was uh, a lone widow. Uh, <laughs> and it didn't put him off, which was the amazing thing. Because I'd felt for so long like just a widow, just a mom, just a, a milk machine, whatever I was. But yeah. to have someone, like you said, finding me attractive even though i've got a toddler hanging off my leg and everything it was a massive confidence boost um you are so, a babe by the way i would just i will just point yeah, that out that. for anybody that hasn't seen and you you are a babe i've let myself go a little <laughs> bit recently i was um was much slimmer when he met me um but still he li- i think i think he liked me for me i think yeah. i hope <laughs> absolutely um, well, it sounds well, like it <laughs> and how how did he kind of integrate into your family and what was he like with your kids? He was absolutely wonderful with the kids. I didn't um, agree to go out with him long term at first because when we first went on our date, on our first date, sorry, um, he said, this, uh, we were chatting and he said, oh, he'd been out of work for a little while. And he said that it was because he was ill. And I joked, I was like, oh, a man flu. It was like, ha no cancer. And I'm like, oh, okay. So it turned out he'd already had cancer twice. Um, And at this point he was 31 and he'd had it at age 17 and at age 24. Um, And he'd had, he'd got to remission both times. He'd beaten it both times. Um, So I was like, ah, that throws a spanner in the works for me because I don't know if I could cope with that happening again. Um, So it took me a week or so. And I had to sit down and think, if I'd have known Jason's outcome, if I'd have known the way things would have gone, would I have still dated him? And of course, the answer is yes. I would have always met him. I would have always married him. I would have always had kids with him because I wouldn't want to lose all that joy just because I knew the despair that was coming. So I kind of took the same 
approach with Tom, I was like, well, worst case scenario, it was only a 5% chance the cancer was going to come back anyway. Worst case scenario, that happens. But in the meantime, we get to have a lot of fun. And we did. We had a lot of fun. We made so many memories. And we only had six months of ignorance, if you will. Um, but we had family days out and we had little weekends away and he just brought so much joy to everyone's life. It, it was, again, a new lease of life for all of us. And we really broke out of that cycle of sadness, which had consumed us for a little while. Of course. Jess, we, you mentioned there that there was a 5% chance of this, <laughs> this illness returning. And in, on, in the January it did, didn't it? You received the news that it had come back. Mm -hmm. um I mean it makes my blood run cold and you know as, as I've talked about my my second husband he got very sick and I was told that he may not make it so yeah. I describe this as kind of being dangled over the prep over the cliff edge you were dropped over the cliff edge weren't you my darling you were dropped um and again I, I know it's quite difficult to talk about but could you take us back back to that time yeah well um we got the diagnosis a year before he actually died. Uh, he'd been feeling a little unwell, um, just sort of virus-like symptoms, nothing major. With having non-Hodgkin's lymphoma before, and he already had one stem cell transplant, his immunity was slightly lower than normal people's anyway. Um, but if he was starting to feel some pains, and he likened them to the last time um, he had it. And he had to really push for an appointment and for a scan to be done earlier than he would have had it done. Um, so he got that done on either Boxing Day or the 27th of um, December in 27... No, 2016, sorry. 2016. Thanks, thanks. Just into January that he got the news that the cancer was back. But they were all very confident. You've beaten it twice before. You'll beat it again this time. And he actually did. So he had all of his oh. chemotherapy, he had another stem cell transplant, and he was in remission. Um, he and I did take a little break after he had his stem cell transplant, because after a full year of intense um, appointments and things like that, my mental health was shattered, and he did not have the energy <laughs> to deal with me. I did not have the mental energy to deal with him, because at times I was juggling three kids at home during the day and then driving over an hour to see him every night at the hospital and it just took so much out of me. So we agreed we were going to take a break. So two months we did. Uh, but Health-wise, he was absolutely brilliant. Um, then we got back together, rekindled everything and it was just as amazing as it was before. He got this new lease of life with this... Um, diagnosis where he was cancer free and everything was amazing and we had another couple of great months but then um a couple of weeks before christmas in 2017 he started feeling virus-like symptoms again um a little off his food uh, his skin started changing color slightly which indicated a liver a problem mm -hmm. and he fought and fought to stay at home over christmas because uh, he wanted to spend it with the boys and with me and part of me wonders if he knew that it yeah. wasn't going to be good news but he kept saying I don't want to be in hospital no one's working anyway whatever happens we'll deal with it and in hindsight it wouldn't have made the blindest bit of difference if he'd have gone in earlier because what they yeah. actually found once he was in hospital was that he had something called GVHD which is graft versus host disease so his stem cell transplant that he had um, his body effectively saw it as an alien um, life form and started shutting down organs so that it couldn't control them, if you will. It didn't recognise it as something that was there to help it. So effectively, he had multiple organ failure because his body shut those organs down and it was over a few weeks and we kept on hoping and hoping that he would get better. On the 6th of January 2018, he got told he only had a couple of days to live. Um, and his first words were, but I'm only 32. 
And obviously I've gone past that age now and just the thought of at 32 being told you've only got a couple of days to live must be absolutely harrowing. And you could see it, you could see it yeah. on his face that he was scared at first. Um, it's so hard. It's, uh, my hairs are all stood up. Um we're hearing you say that, you know, hearing the news at 32 that you you weren't going to live, you know, more than a few days. The poor guy and, and poor you and hearing you talk about the strain on your mental health. And it's something that we, again, it's not something that's talked about often is the impact of being cancer adjacent or death adjacent and however it comes and having to support somebody you love through uh, through the treatment. Um, yeah, I... I, I, I Presumably, you've you've had to have some therapy yourself. Um, you must have had something to cope with. with did you have anything during the time? Um, I didn't have it at the time. I've had. Um, well, I did some therapy after Jason died uh, and some CBT, which I think gave me quite good coping skills throughout Tom's um, treatment. Really, not around the time of death. I think sort of instinct took over uh, on those last few days in particular. Jess, I'm going to ask you now, um, again, I've not had to ask them, I guess, to go back to this twice uh, during the conversation. Yes. Yeah. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what happened at the end? Because you and Tom actually got married in the hospital, didn't you? Yeah, we did. Um, so after Tom got told he only had a couple of days to live, um, he took some time to himself. I sat on the floor outside his hospital room, um, just waiting for him to be ready to talk because obviously he wasn't at first um so after yeah. the left he sat in the dark on his own just contemplating and then after about an hour he said right i'm ready we went back in and he it was almost like a switch had flicked he was back to his jokey normal self i think he sort of i think he figured if i'm oh if i've only got limited time i'm gonna have to make the most of it um, and he did, and um, he was making jokes and he was talking about the songs he wanted at his funeral. He wanted a beige buffet of food and he wanted <laughs> ring of fire played as he went into the crematorium. Um, so wow. Was wow. He told me Did that people... Did he do it? Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what he wanted, he got. Um, yeah, well, quite, yeah. <laughs> it was really funny. I think cause people knew his humour as we walked in and that song started playing and it echoes around the crematorium. People at first were like taken aback, but then after a few seconds, the laughter just erupted and it was it was an amazing moment. Um, so I'm so oh, glad... This is wonderful. I like doing this. Yeah. I'm so glad he got to choose those sort of things. But during those um, mm. the time before he died, um, he said to me, so people are going to start calling you Black Widow now. I said, that's absolutely fine, I'll let it. And I said, I'm not a widow anyway, I said, because um, you're doing anything to try and avoid marrying me. Because um, we had said before he got taken ill this time, he was like, let's get Christmas and New Year out of the way and let's get married, let's move in together because we didn't live together. Um, and we had all these big plans. And I was like, oh, you'll do anything to get out and marry me. And he said, I don't think we've got time. But there was a nurse in the room with us. And she was, she sort of like, if you don't mind me uh, butting in, she was like, I can pull a few strings and speak to a few people and we can see what we can do. And it was just left at that, I'll see what I can do. So we didn't know anything of it until five hours later, a registrar comes in and he's like, he was dressed in the shiny shoes and he had on a waistcoat and a, a tie and he looked so dressed up because he'd just come from another wedding. Um and Tom made a joke that he was showing him up because he was better dressed than he was. Um, and we signed all our forms and we actually got married um, in the hospital that evening. It wasn't a glamorous affair. Tom had his hospital gown. I had a white plastic apron on. Um, <laughs> and I'd been living in the hospital for a few days at that point. So you can imagine how I looked. It wasn't amazing, but it didn't matter. We got no. the moment that that we... We'd, we'd not dreamed of the moment being like that, but we got it. We got we got to be husband and wife, and the um, he didn't refer to me as Jess after that. For the time he spoke, he only referred to me as wife. So I'm glad it's just we got, wife, <laughs> just wife, yeah. And after we'd got married, and everyone left the room. 
climbed up on his bed and we listened to some music um, and it was just lovely. After that, people came to visit him and I stayed at the room. I wanted to give them their time with him. And by the time I went back in, about 11 midnight, um, he was fast asleep. So I went in night, I sat on his bed, um, probably stinking because, you know, can't get a shower in those places. Uh, and I sat with a cup of tea while he just slept. And he didn't really re- regain consciousness after that, apart from to utter a few words, but they weren't really coherent. Oh, Jess, that is agonizingly beautiful, that story. Um, you can sort of, the love is, is quite tangible in your voice. Um, and, you know, just an un- unimaginable um, pain to go through. And I'm really grateful that you told us that so candidly. Um, I have to ask, how would I ask you to tell the children? Well, I'd been back the day bef- the day that we found out he only had a couple of days to live. I'd been back to the house because, like I said, I was living at the hospital. I think it had been three days since I'd seen the kids. And I went in and at the time, like, oh, I don't have a medical background. All I could go for was the sats on his, on the screen seemed to be improving. Um... Everyone was positive when they were coming into the room. No one had said, there's not much more we can do for him. It was a case of everyone was just pushing on and pushing on. So when I went home to see the kids, I'd said to them, oh yeah, he's going to be absolutely fine. The doctor and nurse are doing the best job they can. Um, So the kids, as far as they were concerned, he was going to be fine. So for me to return three days later and say, I'm really sorry, I took him one at a time upstairs so I didn't want to do it all together because then it's three lots of emotions to deal with all at once mm-hmm. and I had to tell them that he died and that the doctors and nurses did absolutely everything they could but there was nothing more they could do because as it turned out the sats were improving because they had increased all the support they were giving him he was on maximum oxygen support he was on maximum pain relief and his sats still they looked okay but that was because he had all this support and without it he wouldn't survive um of artificial readings isn't it yeah yeah um his stats were so good because the machines were doing all the work for him um so i had to go home and say actually it didn't go as we hoped um i did tell them that i married him and i don't think kids really care about romantic things um so (laughs) too much to them at the time and so I took them all up one at a time to my room and said, the doctors and nurses did everything they could, but he died. And Toby, I think Toby kind of felt like, oh, well, it's what we're used to. It's just mm. not just the, the one. But he was like, we've been through it before. We'll be fine. George is very matter of fact and very intelligent with his um, emotions. Um, and he was okay with it I think he was was he five I think he was five at the time um and he was very much like oh okay let's deal with that but Barnaby was so attached to him he was a little toddler and as far as Barnaby was concerned it was his only sort of male dad figure we've got other male father figure isn't it yeah he was and they were such great little buddies and he was absolutely heartbroken. And that was the saddest part for me was knowing that Barnaby did not have a chance at having a dad. And not that Tom would have ever replaced his dad because that's not how it works. <laughs> but Barnaby had this chance to have a father figure and that was taken away from him. And yeah, Barnaby was probably the saddest and has been the, has carried the weight of it more than anyone else, I'd say. Oh, poor little mite. And again, you know, if I can relate to a certain extent because um, Cavs didn't really know her dad. So for her, she still calls her dad daddy and John is yeah. her Johnny. Um, but to all intents and purposes, he is her father and he is the father of the boys. But, you know, he he's not and he would never and would never want to replace Ben. But you, you take on that role when you, you know, take even you agree to care for somebody's children, don't you? Yeah. Oh, poor thing. Um, you have got a fourth child, haven't you? And a little girl called Penelope. Am I right? Yes, I do have a bonus baby. 
I had resigned to myself that three children was my limit because Tom and I had discussed having children. He was um, he wasn't able to because of the chemo that he'd had over the years, but he did have um, stores, if you will. So yeah. we had discussed having IVF in the future. But when he died, um, my idea of ever having more children went along with that. So I couldn't imagine ever getting to the point of wanting to have children with someone again. Um, so I was not actively looking for a relationship and I was not actively looking to have more children. However, I think the universe had other plans in store for me. Um, it's often done. Penelope, <laughs> Penelope's father was only ever going to be a fling, um, which he obviously he is aware that was the plan at the start um, but I actually found out I was pregnant um, which caused some difficulties with he and I because we were dating but we weren't at the point where we could have a fully fledged relationship um, so to find out I was pregnant caused him quite a lot of issues um, which have been resolved now but he and I aren't together. Um, we would have never worked as a long-term uh -huh. relationship because um, he doesn't really grasp the complexities of my situation and I don't grasp the yes. complexity. He's a man baby. Got yeah, got yeah. <laughs> and it's something I've talked about quite a bit, sort of, you know, the conversation is, um, you know, people say to me, do I they think that John and I uh, work because we're both widowed? And I genuinely think it, it is, it really helps because you uh -huh. do um, understand the complexities and um, it takes away any sort of, you know, jealousies and issues like that. Um, how does this, how does it work with the boys then? Because obviously they obviously cannot see their father um, and Penelope has in contact with her. So does that, has that created any sort of animosity or jealousy or of the boys, the boys kind of pretty cool with it? How's that worked? So the older two boys are absolutely fine with it. They understand um, the differences. But with Barnaby having this sense of loss and feeling like the odd one out, he sort of was a lot closer with Penelope's dad. Um, and he still is. Um, he has quite a close bond. But obviously when things didn't work out with Penelope's dad and I, um, Barnaby felt the loss of that again. He mm -hmm. felt like father figure was being taken away from him and I felt awfully guilty for that I felt really really bad um because Barnaby felt like his little sister had everything he has never had um yeah. I think now that he's getting a little older he's starting to understand that um it, that with adult relationships it isn't as simple as <laughs> Penelope has now got the things he didn't because um, he obviously knows that me and his dad were together and in love and would have been together for as long as fate would have allowed it. And I think because he sees that Penelope's dad and I don't have that relationship, I think he doesn't see it as a loss so much anymore. Um, yeah. it, when you're widowed, you have, um, and you, you know, you are considering dating or you, you randomly fall into a relationship. Uh, you have a huge responsibility, don't you? Because particularly when you have children, I mean here particularly, because you're you not only are you having to protect your hearts, your poor, broken, damaged heart, you're having to protect the hearts of those children. And so when a relationship doesn't work out and, you know, for whatever reason, you that you take on that extra blame and and you know, pain that and that must have caused you a huge amount of distress alongside the breakdown of your relationship. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I yeah. So, and children don't understand the adult dynamics. And it sounds to me like you, you, you've done such a wonderful job. And, you know, I, I see on social media your children thriving under your care. And it, to protect their little hearts like you have done um, takes an immense courage and amount of love. And I... I admire you, Jess. I really, really admire you. So, what does life look like now? Um, I don't know. I have been through lots of therapy. I have um, taken a lot of time 
to sort of sit with the guilt that I felt when Barnaby had felt that loss of Penelope's dad as well. Um, he's starting to come back round to the idea because he still sees Penelope's dad. They still have days out together and things like that. Um, so I oh, think he's nice. slowly he's slowly healing from that. Um, so oh, I yeah. feel a little less guilty for him going through that. But there's still so much weight on me having done that. Mm-hmm. I am not in a position where I actively want to have a relationship. It's been over 18 months now. Um and I am focusing on the children um, and doing other things that are good for me. Um, I've spent a lot more time with my friends. Um, I've started. I've gone back to work. I'm trying to get a new house, which I can have as a bit of a project, and I can do that mm-hmm. up. I'm trying to throw myself into things that are for me instead of trying to distract from the pain I am feeling, which I think is what. I have done in past relationships is yeah. use it as a distraction from the uncomfortable feelings. So I've taken time to sit with that uncomfortableness and yeah. I think I'm in a pretty good place. It's hard, isn't it? We, you know, we say all the time it's discovering that you can't run from it and you, you have to walk back through it. And in a way that's what we're trying to achieve here and is that, you know, it isn't easy telling your story. You think, you know, no matter how, if, like it's going to be fine I, I tell the story all the time but it isn't easy and it, but it, it takes you back to and it kind of forces you to confront some feelings and you've been <laughs> extraordinarily open and candid and um and honest with us today and for that I am extremely grateful Jess and I wish you we we all wish you joy and happiness and some peace so thank you thank you so much for talking to us Jess we really really do appreciate it Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening today. We'll be back with you soon for more from the front line of loss. But for now, as you were.